Hello, uh, everyone. I'm happy to begin our last uh, research seminar for this uh, semester, uh, our first uh, totally virtual uh, seminar, if I hope the last, but uh, we, we shall see that. Uh, but still, there is a at least for me, there is some uh, nice uh, feeling of the uh, ending of the semester, which gives us a little bit more time for, for doing other things. Our uh, visitor, uh, our, our guest today come from uh, far away, uh, from uh, the US, but now you know that's the one, one of the good things about the Zoom, it makes it easier. Uh, Mark uh, Belief is a professor of international economy economics at the Waston Institute for International and Public uh, Affairs. He finished his uh, PhD at the Columbia University in 1999. He then joined the uh, John Hopkins University uh, before he moved to the Brown, Brown University in 2009, uh, where he is today. His research focuses upon the causes of stability and change in the economy and why people continue to believe stupid economic ideas despite buckets of evidence to the contrary. Uh, the power of uh, com economic idea is common theme in his uh, work, as in his recent award winning book, uh, Austerity, the History of Dangerous Idea, which was uh, out in 2015, and uh, the future of the Euro, uh, again, 2015. And in his most recent book, uh, Angronomics, on which he will talk today, uh, which, was, which appeared this year, and he contributes to several podcasts and his lectures and talks on YouTube are viewed by, he said, millions, and it's literally millions of uh, viewers. And now he, I'm very happy that he's willing to come to talk with a much a smaller group here in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, so thank you for coming and uh, spending your time with us. Gal Hertz will uh, comment on uh, Mark uh, talk. Gal, as you know, we all know, teaches here at the Kohn Institute. He works on questions of uh, intellectual uh, history, uh, questions of, of uh, uh, social sciences, um, sexuality, uh, criminology, and other uh, questions in, a very, in mostly in the European, in the German realm or German speaking realm of the turn of the century broadly defined and we have heard him in the first talk uh, this semester so we have the closure in the last one uh, so mark uh, please the floor is yours thank you very much and thank you all for the invitation to be with you today um quick clarification how long do you want me to talk for uh about uh, 40 minutes 40 okay then i'll aim for 35 so that we have more time that's always good that's um, so let me give you some background on what I'm going to talk about today. It's an unusual book for an academic. Uh, basically, when I did the austerity book, I discovered something which I'd always suspected was true, but uh, it was then confirmed for me, which is that academics can, in fact, write for normal people. That It's actually possible to do this, and, and they're keen to engage. They actually want to understand stuff. So once you make that turn, it's very hard to turn back. And although I have another project, which I'm finishing up this year, which is a very technical thing on growth models in the global economy with, uh, with Lucio Baccaro from Max Planck and Jonas Pontus and from, um, uh, from, uh, from University of Geneva, um, my heart this year, as much as it's been sort of pushed around by a pandemic as everyone else's, has been in this project, which has been Angrynomics. How did this book come about? I say a little bit about it in the introduction if you had a chance to look at the book, but very briefly, when I was doing the research for the austerity book, I wanted to figure out what bond markets actually thought. And if you want to do that, you have to go talk to bond traders. Uh, if you just basically talk to other academics, I all know already what they're going to say and everyone knows what everyone else is going to say. And if you read the financial press, there was all this stuff about bond market vigilantes, these people who are out there waiting to destroy your country because you're not going to pay them the requisite amount of interest. And that just didn't seem right to me, particularly because when Britain uh, began its kind of austerity binge after 2010, uh, it wasn't rewarded for it comparatively by the financial markets. 
In, in fact, the pound, regardless of the fiscal position, basically stayed relatively constant. So I started going to the types of places where you find bond traders, which are their conferences. Now, their conferences are very, very different from our conferences. For a start, it costs you about $5,000 to get in the door. And these things are catered to a standard which you wouldn't believe. Literally, the great feasts of Babylon would pale into insignificance in comparison. So I thought, well, how am I going to get in here? So I played some connections and I got into talk to actually give some talks to these people on the grounds that I might know something they're interested in, like why Europe looks the way it does, etc. So that worked. There was gains in trade. And then I met Eric Lonergan, and Eric Lonergan is that sort of uh, bête noire of, um, of, of leftist, the leftist imagination for the finance industry. He is a hedge fund manager. And I found out something quite extraordinary. He's a lefty hedge fund manager. And there's actually quite a lot of them around. And they understand the great dangers that finance poses, as well as the potential benefits that it can bestow upon a society. So we began doing panels together and we thought it would be nice to write something together. And we thought we would try an experiment. And the experiment was that we would agree the five things we wanted to talk about. We would each give each other 10 things to read. We would read these things. I would show up in London and we would take a bunch of iPhones and we would put them on stands with microphones and we would record our conversations. And that's how we did it, five chapters, five days. And we got it and we got Siri to transcribe it. Now, as you can hear from my accent, I'm Scottish. Eric is Irish. Siri is wonderful because she actually managed to understand what the heck we were saying. And we put it into a dialogue and we read it and we thought it was great. But instantly, we realized no one's going to take you seriously because, you know, the last dialogue that anyone did in publication was Plato. So you're going to have to, like, you know, move on from that. So we put it into a normal text and we put it in a normal text and it was awful. And it sounded exactly what we'd wanted to avoid, which is two reasonably well off or one very rich and one reasonably well off white guys in their fifties telling the world what's wrong with it and what to do about it. So we put it back in the dialogue and we gave it to test audiences and they said that they didn't like it. And then we tried to find a publisher and we went, I have a very good agent in New York. And uh, she tried to get us, you know, all the majors, you know, basic books, all the rest of the right through. None of them would touch it for one reason. It's a dialogue. I don't know how to sell a dialogue. So we ended up going with a much smaller press and we launched it in the middle of a race riot and a pandemic, which is not the best time for anyone to be basically selling a book. But the interesting thing about it was that both the pandemic and the racial justice struggles in the United States over the, uh, the time that it was launched have really added, I think, to the importance of the book. And I don't mean that in a sort of big headed, I'm so important, look at what I'm saying. I mean it in terms of the timing of the book and the very issues that it wants to talk about. If we think about the events of last week and the riot at the Capitol in the United States, there's, to me, a very strong economic underpinning to this. The counterfactual is, if this isn't about economics, what's driving it? Is it suddenly that a large number of Americans have just decided overnight to become overtly racist? Because that's a very, very tough one to explain in and of itself. If something isn't causing that, you can't really explain uh, a rise in the number of racists by reference to more racism. You can't explain more racial conflict by reference to a rise in the number of racists. That's circular. Something has to be causing that. So in a way, the arguments of the book have become more pointed and more divisive in many uh, instances. But nonetheless, I think it's a set of arguments that's worth putting out there. So with that introduction, let me begin. I'm now going to do some screen sharing. And I'm going to bring up some slides and basically give you the sort of the, the classic book talk, as it were. So bear with me. And here we go. Great. I'm going to push you guys over here. Yeah. That's it. Fabulous. All right. Let's go. Can we do this? Excellent. No, you know, let me do that. Why does that not work? This works. Okay, so the basic idea, we don't actually define it in the book this way, this came sort of afterwards, but to a large extent, you know, we hold that it's true. Agronomics is the effect generated when most people in a country believe that the economy no longer benefits them. Someone who read the book in the United Kingdom sent me this infographic. And I think it's a wonderful way of thinking about the underlying pressures and tensions that have brought, this, brought us to this moment. 
So this is the United Kingdom. You see a youth that is basically a college graduate in 1970, and then one in 2020. And if you just have a look at these numbers, they're incredibly revealing. So when you inflation adjust for these figures, when you're looking at real growth, salaries have basically budged by pocket change over what is essentially a 50 year period. Yet at the same time, house prices, something you guys in Israel know all about the cost of housing, has gone through the roof. It's went from 3.4 times the average salary to 9.7. And again, that's looking at average house prices. What really matters aren't the house prices, let's say somewhere um, in the periphery. What matters is in the core growth series, which are multiples of this again, which then creates intense housing competition and inequality. Again, look at the unemployment rate. So much for 30 years, 40 years of neoliberal market reform, you've got twice the unemployment rate you used to have. And of course, we invented that wonderful thing called student debt, which in a world of negative real interest rates is currently being charged at 6.1%, which when you consider that wages haven't grown at all, is essentially net against your real income year after year after year. So I thought that was interesting. I decided to have a look at this and do the same thing for the United States. And if you look at it, it's a very similar story. You've got a 10% real increase in wages over 50 years. The average house price has basically just doubled. It's not as acute as the United Kingdom. But remember, you're not moving to Boise, Idaho once you quit college. You're moving to Boston. And that's when you get the multiples that are the same as what you see in those other global cities. Unemployment's always been sort of higher and more variable in the United States. And again, the average student loan has doubled, or not doubled, it's only gone up by 54% increase in 27, over 27 years. But again, that's the average, and that average is incredibly misleading because of the skewness of the distribution. Many more people are actually like very strapped because of that. So just basically from those two infographics, I would suggest one thing, you can sum it all to this. Let's look at the people who, don't who aren't college graduates. Let's look at the people who are the American working class, about 87 million of them, the blue collar set. So blue collar workers divided by the consumer price index gives you this graph. And what you basically see there is the labor share of national income, how much they were taking home in real terms, the real purchase and power of their paychecks peaked around 1973. There's a rebound around 78 and it declined almost until the 2000s. It has been increasing since then, flattening out with the financial crisis, but nonetheless, you're still below where you were in the 1970s. So back to that infographic, right? You've basically got the cost structures, stresses, markets, contracts, all the things that make up our modern world of the 2020s, and you're using the wages of the 1970s to pay for it for the most stressed and vulnerable group in American society. Little wonder then that people are a bit angry. So in the book, we were looking for a simple way to try and explain this. And we kept coming back to the notion of anger, not because we started out with that, but because that we found that this was not just something that was cropping up every time we looked at these things, but a very simple observation that Eric and I used to say whenever we spoke at conferences was, hey, on average, the world's never been richer. Then why are we all so pissed off with each other? Right? What is it about that average which is in fact so misleading? And why is anger so central to this? So we did a couple of you know, relatively simple things. We, we got uh, IBM Watson's engine to basically do a big data analysis for us on news stories featuring, an featuring anger. And one of the things that came up on that was sports fans. Now, those of you who follow soccer will find this is not a surprise, right? that angry 50-year-old white guys shouting the odds at football matches is not really a shocker. But what's really interesting is if you think about what those fans do, the truest fans, if you've ever been to a really heated soccer match, what you find is that those fans, if you stand amongst them, they're not shouting at the opposition all that much. They're policing their own players for insufficient effort. They're exhorting their own fans to be more loyal, more true, to show their colours. In a sense, what they're doing is they're regulating group norms. They're enforcing tribal codes. And we became really fascinated by this because that's what populism, particularly on the right, seems to be. It's about weaponizing a sense of anger. So the summer that we launched this book, two things are going on. On the bottom frame, of course, you see recent events at the Capitol. That is a bunch of very angry, pretty much all white people. And then what you've got is Black Lives Matter at the top. And you see in these two moments, the two sides of what we call public anger. 
One is moral outrage, and the other one is a weaponized energy, a tribalism, which is used for political purposes. And one engenders the other. Now, I want to mention at this point, I'm not taking a moral position on which one's right. For the record, I think the one on the top is, and the one on the bottom isn't. But that's irrelevant. What matters is that the people involved in this believe that they are making moral claims, and that opens them up to the ability of a political class which has lost its animating sense of purpose to basically weaponize that for votes, right? That's what this comes down to. Now, what makes this more potent than ever are a series of product market and labor market changes which have happened throughout the OECD over the past 30 years, which has basically increased what we call private anger. That is to say the stresses that you feel in your workplace, what exactly the market demands of you, what firms expect of you, what you get in terms of insurance and support from the state or from other agencies. There's been a huge revolution in that, and that has increased what we call the micro stressors, which amplify what's happening in the public side of economics. So that leads us to thinking about, we do this a little bit less sophisticated in the book because it's a general book, but public anger, if you want, is information. Anger is moral outrage, as I've said, is, is a desire to be heard. Think about the claims of the left behind, those, of the, those people who live in Britain in those red wall states, the places referred to by the London media as the places that don't matter. Anger is a reaction to no one cares, right? a, a, an abiding, um, uh, how can I put this, an abiding trope, if you will, about the Clinton campaign in 2016 was the campaign was all about the candidate and it was nothing about the people that were trying to represent. The same thing could now be leveled at Trump's charge as well. Anger is a reaction to off-limit areas of concern. This was particularly important in Scandinavia, whereby any discussion of immigration was deemed to be politically taboo and could lead to social censure. The result was that only right-wing parties could talk about immigration, and that's what they capitalized upon over the past 10 years. And this points to a broader failure of representative institutions and political parties to actually represent the interests of the people that they supposedly represent. And the work by Marty Gillins, begun in 2015, Gillins and Page, and then a host of other studies in political science on representation gaps, which show that basically parliaments legislate for the preferences of the top 80% of the income distribution and no one else really gets a look in, really shows that there's some empirical ballast and underpinning to these feelings. This leads, of course, on the right to the rise of anti-immigration politics. And for those of us who look at the underlying economic trends, the key claim is that this is related to that collapse of real wage growth and increasing inequality in wealth and income and opportunity. So we think about private anger, just to flesh this out a little bit, as the micro stressors that pu amplify public anger. Very interesting way to see this is the work that Jake Hacker and others have done on risk shifts, how essentially insurance costs have just been unloaded onto labor away from firms. Think of subcontracting, zero hour contracts, uh, making your workers franchisees, et cetera. All of the reward goes with capital, all of the risk remains with, with labor. But what do we see across the OECD as well? A rise in mental illness and epidemiological inequality. If you have a look at the work of epidemiologists um, such as um, the folks behind the Wellcome Trust who did um, the spirit level in 2015, where basically you get a huge R square on anything at all that you chuck into the matrix with inequality in any social bad you want from criminal recidivism to obesity to heart disease. Again, thinking about this in particular in terms of uh, particular subgroups, think about increasing housing costs, uh, the fracturing of family structures over time, the rise of single parents that need to work, and the shifts in labor market deregulation towards platforming, zero hour contracts, etc. cetera. Uh, Eric put it uh, well in a talk when we were uh, doing an interview once, said I was originally trained as a labor economist and I was trained at the high point if you will of neoliberal reform in the aftermath of the OECD jobs report and we were told that flexibility was good and that unions were bad and so on and so forth and we could chart all these lovely labor market optima that we, we were uh, doing through this deregulatory move. None of us ever stopped to consider the people that were affected by this and I think that is actually a very profound insight that we are putting that. 
And then finally, of course, on top of all this, is a couple of existential threats coming around the corner, which is number one, all the rich societies in the world are getting old, something I'll have more to say about in conclusion, and it's actually more important than we think. And then finally, the, sort of the other one is the robots, the robotic revolution. This time it's different, the robots are coming for our jobs. So if you think about the micro sectors here, you're gonna have your job taken away by a robot. You're gonna pay your own insurance costs. You can't even guarantee if you've got regular working hours. You've got zero support for raising your family and it costs a fortune to rent a house. Yeah, I'd be pissed too. Basically, that's the micro side. So this gives you all political scientists and others, other fellow travelers like two by twos. So you can throw it all into a two by two. Public anger and moral outrage tend to be generated when you get large scale macroeconomic crashes, something I'm gonna talk about next. Moral outrage and private anger, that tends to be the micro stressors, technological change, market reforms, aging, et cetera. And then the weaponization of this tribal energy is also macroeconomic crashes, but it's the flip side of moral outrage, dog whistle politics, immigration concerns, heightened nationalism, and the particularly pernicious symbiosis of media and reactionary politics that we see across the world, particularly in the US today. And then finally, the last one, this cell used to be blank, but over the past year, it's been quite easy to fill it in. Private anger and tribal energy. When do you see this expressed? You see it in boogaloo movements, QAnon, mask resistance, stop the steal. The idea that you are alone of the ones that can see the truth of this terrible world that's unraveling before your eyes and you and other true patriots need to stand up and uh, stand up and protect us from it exposed very much as public anger but ultimately manipulated uh by uh, by interests behind those claims themselves so shifting along let's quickly get through this this is how the book works the first two chapters set all that up and then we unpack macroeconomics. And we had to find a way to do this. And the way that this evolved was after talking to finance people for a while, I got really interested in tech. And I also discovered that going and giving conference talks is a really great way of finding people in these industries who actually know what they're talking about, as opposed to other academics who write books about it, who actually just read other academics who write books about it. So when you go to tech conferences, they're fascinated by money. You know, they love Bitcoin and all this sort of stuff, right? but they don't understand a damn thing about how the macro economy works. So I made up this analogy of capitalism essentially being like a computer. So you have a certain combination of hardware and software, and that's the machine. Everyone has a labor market. The Germans have a labor market. The Americans have a labor market. They're massively different, right? Everyone has a capital market. The Germans have a capital market. Half their firms don't list on, on an exchange. The Americans have one. It's just a giant IPO machine, right? So you have the same hardware, but it's different. And the differences in the hardware necessitate writing different types of software, economic ideas that run the show. So how do you explain big macroeconomic crashes in that framework? So the first one it is to think about capitalism 1.0, the gold standard. And there's Carl Poyani's famous quote, to allow the market mechanism to be the sole director of the fate of human beings and the natural environment would result in the demolition of society. So the hardware of 1.0 was of course the classical gold standard, open markets, free flows of commodities and people and money, and very much the limited liberal state that Pollyanna wrote about, lazy fare, sound money, hands off. The software of course that runs this, classical economics, lazy fare, the doctrine of sound money, don't get involved, don't try and work against business cycles, do not bail out recessions. The bugs in the software, this is why Pollyanna is on the slide, the labor is not a commodity. And if you run a global economic system where adjustment to trade shocks is made through the downward movement of wages, and if it makes sense for you to be an exporter, because that brings you in gold rather than an importer that gets rid of gold, then what you want to do is be an exporter. But too many exporters in the economy at once can only produce price deflation, which makes the collapsing wage problem endemic and thus you end up with a crisis. That crisis was resolved in nationalism through World War I and depression. So that was the hardware, the software, the bugs in the system, the system crash. Second one is the Keynesian reboot, right? Keynes, of course, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but escaping from old ones. The hardware this time were much more national economies, that is to say isolated, very much protected from free flows of finance, restricted labor movements as well key to this capital controls to allow you to have fiscal space 
and to control your own interest rates. High taxes and transfers, basically to pay for that welfare state that you promised the workers for fighting fascism, and a full employment target as the main government target, regardless of how you get there. The software, Keynes, Keynesian ideas, Keynesian macro stabilization ideas, and the bugs in the software were actually predicted way back in 1943 by an economist called Mikhail Kaletsky, who said, hang on, think about this. If you run a full employment target for 30 years, what happens? It means that you're going to have incredibly tight labor markets. That means the median wage is going to be built, bid up. It means that skill workers, the ones you really want, you're going to have to continually pay more. You can do this so long as you can increase productivity ahead of wage growth. But if you ever get to the point where wage growth goes ahead of productivity, you're going to produce inflation. Inflation is a tax on profits. At that point, capital is going to run away from the bargain and they're going to run back to sound money and finance. And he wrote that in 1943. And it's exactly what happened in the system crash of the 1970s, which was stagflation. What's the reset that comes from this? Well, this is Milton Friedman time. Inflation is taxation without legislation. The hardware modification of the time that was incredibly important was the rise of independent central banks. The whole point of that was to crush inflation. And when you do so, you restore the real value of profit. That's the point of the system. To do that, you permanently disinflate the system by freeing up capital flows, privatizing, liberalizing, and eventually globalizing so that the net returns go to capital rather than labor. The software was neoclassical economics. And the bugs in the software, which we became aware of in 2008, and we've showed already in that graph, was wage stagnation, asset bubbles, massive amount of bank leverage, and a huge growth in inequality in the system. The system crash of 2008 exposes this in the global financial crisis. But the problem was there was no reset. If you think about it, after World War I and the Great Depression, there was an attempt to build an entirely new order. That was really reasonably stable for around 35 years, and it began to fall apart. And when it fell apart, there was, again, another set of profound political, economic, and unpolitical and economic interventions to reconfigure the system. This time around, there was none. The central banks, the governors of the system, the ones that were meant to disinflate the economy, chucked $17 trillion yen and euros into the global economy and liquidity to bail out the system. None of the underlying bugs were addressed, nor have they been addressed. There is not a single political party anywhere across the OECD that I'm aware of that is in power that has a serious program to reduce inequality or to actually rein in financial fragility, instead of which the central banks are doubling down again and again on ever deeper puts into the financial markets to hope to keep the whole game going. The software effectively has been patched. The hardware is still the same. Austerity, as we found out, makes things worse, and we're probably going to do it again. And the result is macroeconomics becomes angrynomics. This is the macro underpinning as to why, when you get these tensions and you get these crashes and system resets, you get these outpourings of anger. It happened in the 20s and 30s, it happened in the 70s and 80s, and it's happening again now. The micro side of this, capitalism is a stress machine. Think about hardware modifications here, deunionization and labor market liberalization. In theory, good things, more flexibility, greater adult, uh, optimization of labor input, et cetera, et cetera. The result, greater inequality, precarious work conditions, contingent contracts and, and benefits being cut. Product market liberalization. We don't think about this as being important, but it's actually incredibly important and incredibly stress inducing. I mean, it's absolutely true that the cost of your laptop has plummeted to the point that they're now something you could buy with spare change. But at the same time, what does that mean for the margins of the firms that are involved in those supply chains? Turns out these days, the majority of firms, if you look at the Gini coefficient of profits, hardly make any money at all. There's a handful of big tech and other giants at the top, and then there's a few supply chain companies that are critical to them, and everyone else is in the supply chain has got razor thin margins. What's the result of that? Wages stagnate. Even if your employer wants to give you a raise, they can't because their margin is 2%. Profit dispersal widens and you end up with the Amazons versus everyone else. And then Amazon doesn't have to pay anyone any money because them and Uber get together and buy the labor law that they want in California, which is what they did for $200 million last Christmas while no one was looking. Financial market liberalization. No need to talk about this too much. I've been living it for 10 years. Continual credit builds up, private debt builds up in particular in financial fragility. 
what's happening now on the side of corporate balance sheets is just an astonishing growth in debt that cannot possibly be valorized unless there's much, much more growth than we've had in the past 20 years. So this is an accident waiting to happen. And then finally, globalization. It's not fashionable to beat down on it anymore, but unfortunately you have to, because what it has meant is that the capital share increases and the wage share stagnates or falls. To go back to that graph earlier, the US um, wage share going to labor in 1973 was 57, no, 67%, I think it was. And it fell to about 58. So it's a 9% swing over 30 years. When you think that 95% of people who work in the economy are wage earners, that means that 5% of people made off with a 10% swing in GDP over 30 years. A recent publication by the Rand Foundation looked into this and estimated that the vacuuming up in the United States of all of these tax regulation and financial and product market changes has been $55 trillion that's gone to the top. $55 trillion. I mean, this is a mind boggling amount of money that's been vacuumed up to the top, which is why Jeff Bezos can basically plan his escape to Mars. And that's not a joke. That's actually true. Now, two things I'll say mention in closing here, two particularly, particularly important ones, happy to talk about this in the Q&A. The first one gets a lot of attention, robots. I think it's massively overblown. The other one that doesn't get a lot of attention is we're all getting older. And I think that one matters a lot more. Here's why. Aging societies is a stress generator, but not for the old. So to take the American figures again, uh, boomers, baby boomers, those born before 1964, vote more. In fact, they vote twice as much as millennials. And the top 20% of those boomers have 80% of all financial assets. So to refer back to that work of Mark Gillens and others, if Congress everywhere really legislates for the top 20%, what they're doing is they're writing the rules for old people. That's basically how it's going. The top 20% of that top 20% have 64% of all financial assets. So a tiny sliver of old people have 64% of all the wealth in the United States. The young, because we invented student debt for them, have no assets but have debt, which has massive impacts on fertility and asset formation going forward, which means that your ability for them to pay taxes and earn an income over the lifetime is impaired. That politicizes immigration. Why? Because ultimately you need more people in the country because the boomers didn't have enough kids and today's kids aren't going to have enough kids and you've generated a huge pile of debt. So how do you pay that back? You bring in immigrants. Problem, the number one group that dislikes immigrants are baby boomers. Problem on top of that, an old society cannot generate consumption growth, right? You've already bought the fridge. You've already bought the car. You're not planning for a bigger house ever. So if all of the cash is trapped with that group, you can only have falling consumption, hence you will have falling investment demand, which is why we see stagnant investment across the world. And finally, what makes it really suck is these are, this is the one group most likely to deny global warming. So just add all that together on top of it, and you've actually got not just a class conflict, but an intergenerational conflict, which has massive class drivers. So Thomas Piketty talks about this as the new patrimonialism that he estimates that by 20 years from now, what's going to matter more is not where you're educated and what your salary is, but which family you marry into. Because if that family was smart enough to buy property in London or Paris in the 1980s and kept it in the family, that will be far more consequential for your lifetime learning than anything you do in the labor market. So how do we calm the anger? He said with a little Leninist Stodella, it's on the other corner. So what we talk about in the book is, well, we're not talking about this in the book, which should have, we came up with the metaphor afterwards through talks, moving the furniture around. How do you change the dynamics in your economy without resorting to a list of policies? So we've got four problems, increasing intergenerational equality. What we talk about in the book is a citizen's wealth fund financed by financial crashes. Basically, if the economy is gonna crash every 10 years and we're gonna bail it out, why do we bail it out for the people that already took the risks? Why do we then put the costs on everyone else who actually doesn't have the assets? Next time this happens, why don't we basically take the safe assets we're going to issue called government debt to bail out the system, buy all the equities that have been dumped, put it into a passive fund that's miles away from politicians, and then let the equity premium grow 6% a year. If you did that with 20% of GDP over 10 years, you could pay back all the debt. And in the case of the United States, you would have around three or $4 trillion. Uh, which you could do a Green New Deal, you could free finance education, 
you can do a whole bunch of stuff that would take the stress off of people's lives. Building common assets, digital dividend. Why on earth are we giving Amazon data for free? We don't give up cell phone frequencies for nothing. We auction them off. Why don't we take single sign-on regulation seriously and basically de-platform the platforms and empower the consumers? Full proofing recessions, direct monetary transfers. COVID has proven that we can do this and the whole world doesn't fall apart if you do. And then helicopter money and dual interest rates, we're already doing this, at least at the ECB, we just need to do more of it. Now, these are pretty technical fixes. This isn't the stuff that you jump on the barricades for. But the thing is we like about them is because they're neither necessarily left nor right. They can attract bipartisan support, which means they could last more than one election. And the second thing is they actually work. They will do stuff if you try it. Now, and here's my closing slide. Why start there? Why not start on other fronts? Aren't there other concerns? Sure. But here's the really big one, right? And it's called decarbonization. Now, here's the electoral map after November 2020. So have a look at that map on the left-hand side. There's the red states. Now, look over here on the right. Opportunities for carbon taxes at the state level. It's almost exactly the same. The ones where you have very challenging, in other words, the most scope for action, is where the Republicans get elected. Why? Because the business model of those states is heavily implicated, if not entirely dependent upon, the location, exploitation, extraction, transformation, and distribution of carbon and its derivatives. If you basically want to decarbonize the coasts of the United States, because people living in Providence, Rhode Island, who are professors, all we care about is electricity, and we'd like to have it regenerated by solar panels. We don't like coal anymore. Okay, what's plan B for West Virginia once you go down that road? There's an existential politics here, because what you're saying is the business model of two-thirds of the states in the United States is going to end, and has to end for us to survive. How do you sell that unless you've got other things, other um, articles, of other things in the room that will change the economic outlook for those states? You're going to need an absolute ton of capital to do the type of investment you need in green infrastructure decarbonization. And you need to start exactly in those red states to make this work. So our reason for starting there uh, with those policies is because if you want to get to here, you're going to have to put the plumbing in place to make that happen. And that's what the last part of the book is about. So with that in mind, I think I more or less hit the target. I will now stop sharing and I will stop talking. There we go. Thank you very much for, the, for uh, this very fast uh, move. So we'll, of course, we'll have many questions, I guess, on, on, on various uh, points. And but let's- I uh, apologize uh, for being Scottish. <laughs> no, 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 quick. no. I, we talk quick. <laughs> no, 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 no need for apologize. That's uh, gives us enough uh, food for thought. So that's good. So Gal, please, uh, we like to hear you. So thank you so much, Mark, for a fascinating uh, talk. And uh, let me uh, suggest my uh, comment. So it is a great privilege to comment on such a rich and insightful book, which puts forward a powerful and concise analysis while at the same time insists on a dialogue, not only between the two authors, but also with the reader. The book avoids jargon and complicated formulations and succeeds in doing that without reducing the depth of its, of its arguments. It is not only an important read for anyone who wants to gain a new perspective on economy and politics today, but also a fun read. Broadly speaking, I find the analysis convincing, especially in the way it beautifully depicts, depicts how we got to where we are at. But I wonder whether precisely if we do agree with the analysis of the problem as presented in the book and as you just presented right now, uh, can we also accept the solutions that are suggested? In a nutshell, my concern is that the solutions might all come back to a forms of redistrib redistribution but if the reality is about political tribalism interconnected with financial disparity and exploitation, and if we agree that economy is indeed not merely about numbers and capital, but also has to do with anger-driven social relations, how could better distribution solve the problem? In other words, if the capitalist software is in grave need of repair, as the book argues, how could the answer be, let's simply chip in? 
And I'll elaborate on that in a second. So uh, in sum, I completely, uh, uh, with the book, up until chapter five, dialogue five. <laughs> and there my suggestion begins. So uh, let me begin with a quote from a book. Uh, populism is the result of not uh, resetting the system after a crash. Whatever it's the anger that gives a po polarization in the US politics, populism in, uh, in German politics or Brexit in British politics, the system should have been reset and it wasn't by failing to make fundamental changes to the system that has become a stress generator for the majority of those population we have created the conditions for another round of transformative agronomics so we are completely on the same page here that sounds compelling and comes as a conclusion to one of the best description i've ever heard of the uh, economic environment in which we live how private debt uh, was nationalized by central banks, how decoupling of capital, capital and labor emerged, and how this process paved the way to a powerless labor unions and the creation of credit junkies. Uh, there's a beautiful slide uh, that uh, you, you show, a beautiful commercial you show uh, in the book about this uh, Citibank uh, craving, <laughs> A craving account, right? Yeah, so this open a cravings account. And the, the, the funny thing about that, it's even worse, is that this was the first ever $100 million advertising campaign from a bank. And the campaign was called Live Richly. I mean, just, just think about it. So an economy that is based on the following shtick, which is in Yiddish a word for what we call in America, what, what calls in America, shenanigans. Uh, we all spend more than we can afford. Yet, if, if the financial wizard play it right, they gain. And if they lose, it is we, the public, that pays. This is indeed a cause for anger. Yet in the politics we are living in today, it is not exactly the, the direction in which uh, it goes. And definitely it is not a call for a reset. But the struggle over what I see as over pieces of the pie uh, which in, in, in times of insolvency seems as fictional uh, as ever. All, uh, uh, we can, we've seen demonstrations in the US. The demonstrations were not about uh, economics. They were talking about Black Lives Matter. And here we have every Saturday uh, in, Tel in the Jerusalem demonstrations against Bibi, which is a beautiful example for precisely the kind of tribalism you've been talking about and how to motivate fractions of the electoral vote in order to win elections. So how to orient these protests to economic angle, how to translate these energies to address the financial crisis that threatens to destroy life and ma of masses of people, particularly those of young generations. And what should be the demand of such a movement that calls for a reset? The book, is not providing a clear answer and instead appeals to helicopter money and central banks balance sheets. The solution that the book suggests rests on the idea, if I understand it right, that this new post 2008 economic system opens a, an opportunity currently used mainly by corporates and brokers. Since there is much money supply, you can borrow cheap and use the funds to get great returns on investments buy a house with 1% one per, one per, one per, uh, interest rate and rent it for six. This is an example from the book. Uh, so uh, if I can do that as an individual, why shouldn't the state do that? And then we can fund the, the national uh, wealth uh, fund and all these other great stuff that you suggest. And so if the, uh, if the state can print money without risking inflation, why not create this wonderful welfare state and support everyone. And even though, as you stress, this should not be money, of, money for nothing and services for free, uh, the, but, but assets and, but, but rather assets and compensation such as data dividends, I still wonder whether this adds up to the reset you envision. My concern is that at the end, the suggestion might be that the state should join the bonanza make use but not change the software. 
Let me put this on, on another way. Such solutions such as, as this uh, National uh, Wealth Fund or UBI address distribution, not production. This becomes even more dramatic as the current, uh, at the current uh, COVID crisis when masses of workers stay home under lockdown and don't produce anything as GDP dropping, we nevertheless see the stock market booming. The gap between Main Street and Wall Street has never been larger, while helicopter money inflates gigantic bubbles in unprecedented proportion. This money goes into the pockets of the corporate CEOs, brokers, and big investors. They are not used for stimulating production, but instead allow corporate to buy back their shares or use IPOs to raise amazing amounts of funds of companies that either losing money like Airbnb or DoorDash, or, to, uh, or, or by uh, companies on the verge of bankruptcy like Hertz, which although it sounds like my name, I don't own this company. So anyway, if I am an unemployed millennial watching all this, maybe I'll be angry, but probably instead of looking for a low paying job, which is not clear if I even get, I'll go into Robinhood app and try my luck. The tragedy here, as in any casino, the house always wins. This kind of, is, is this kind of economy sustainable? Could we just print our way out of this crisis? Isn't that, uh, uh, isn't this what helicopters do uh, and, and, and just move wealth into the hands of the few, a process that is the meanwhile got different names such as can, uh, continual effect or neo-feudalism. Many indicators show that inflation is, or, is already here we see it when we compare dollars to Bitcoin, gold, or other assets. Am I missing anything here? So I read many Wall Street sharks who also criticize this policy. It is as if they are saying, hey, shenanigan is our business. So how come now the Fed is stepping in too? Uh, do we need a shenanigans-based world for state? Will that, that dividend really help us push the economy? Or will it just turn people into passive Netflix consumers on payroll? The World Economic Forum went on a new campaign recently, which goes, the year is 2030. I owe nothing. I have no privacy. But life has never been better. To me, this is not an ideal, but a dystopic focus for the future. And this is precisely the kind of thing I'm angry about. So I hope this anger will be useful in promoting the much needed agronomical reset. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gal. And I think the, first we'll give uh, Mark uh, the chance to uh, react for that and then uh, we'll open the floor. Sure, uh, just to say, I mean, I'm happy to continue longer if you want. I mean, this is, this is, this is great and I, I'm more than happy to continue this discussion if you, if you guys want. Um, brilliant comments, I, I agree with all of them. My only, how would, I, how would I start this? Here's how I would start this. Um, there's a website that's called something like whattriberyou.com and it's basically a big data harvesting operation for a polling firm, but I can't tell you which one it is. And so far, about 20 million people worldwide have stuck their data into it. And it divides you into tribes. And it says, you know, are you in the United States? Do you think you're a Republican or Democrat? Would you agree with the following policy proposal? Right? So, da, 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 da. so you can play games with this thing because it's just a simple sorting algo. And you can go in and go, I'm going to go full Bernie Sanders, right? And I've done this. And you go in and you check all the boxes that are the most left-wing boxes possible, something that would be much more than we propose, an actual reset of production, of ownership, the whole nine yards, right? And I'm not, I'm not saying that this is to be believed, but it certainly shaped my thinking. And it's kind of explains why people like Bernie and Corbyn don't get elected. It turns out there's about 14% of people who actually full-bloodedly agree with those solutions. That's really hard to build an electoral majority of any kind of consideration if that's really the case. Because there are braver solutions out there. They're not necessarily better. They're certainly more far-reaching. The further you reach, the harder it is to grasp. But I get nervous about those things. So let me take a couple of these comments in the order they were. You know, can we accept these solutions, redistribution and tribalism, is it enough? How does better distribution solve the anger that you see in things like Trumpism? Again, I can only say it's a first step because the other way of looking at it has no step. And here's what I mean by that. 
the one thing that the social sciences have done over the past 50 years or 70 years even that really is a contribution, and I, I, I think this is indisputable, is that it dismantled the category of race. It showed that there really is no such thing as a racial essence, that what we do when we look at someone who is Catholic, who is Jewish, who is black, who is whatever it happens to be, is that we push a whole bunch of social scripts onto them and put them into categories and stereotype, et cetera, et cetera. That's what the social sciences did. Now what we seem to have done is forget all that. And we say that there's a thing called the white working class and they're all racist. And that there are Mexicans and Mexicans should vote Democrat. And then we get really wigged out when a third of them don't, right? Because what we're doing is a kind of neo-essentialism which in a way is exactly what racists do, right? They say that black people are like this, which is why I am superior as a white person, right? And I deeply worry that what we're doing, if we fall down that road, if we say it's all a culture camp, right? This is all just a big cultural struggle, that essentially I'm essentializing you, you're essentializing me, and then it becomes absolutely zero sum. If you at least start with this being an underlying problem of distribution, you can try it, you can have a go, it might not work, but I'm not sure what the kind of the, the policy or political alternative is to that, other than having a giant race war, which I don't think is what anyone should be aiming for. So I do worry about the alternative to going this road, incrementalist as it is, being something which either there really is no electoral market for, you're just not gonna to get to do it. That's my main problem with MMT, if anybody's interested in modern monetary theory, you're never going to get that elected, right? It's never going to happen in the Congress. You're never going to have the institutions of control to do this stuff. So why spend all this time thinking that you can? I don't understand that. And it's the same with this one. If you just want to color it as a culture camp, then, you know, we know how that ends. It's really, really ugly. Um, are the technical solutions enough? Again, I've got the same answer, which is, a, which is not a good one, which is, but it's one I believe, which is that this is incremental. If you can at least do this stuff, it's going to give the state much, much more room for maneuver going forward to incrementally try something bigger. But if you try and do it all from the position that we're in now, I just don't see how it works. It just becomes basically lefty professors talking to each other with having no electoral impact. I'd rather have a fund 10 years from now that has four trillion in it that basically acts as a kind of financial counterbalance to the excesses of the private sector. And once you've done that, then you can turn around and really discipline the private sector if you need to, right? Rather than saying, we're just gonna pass a bunch of laws and everything will be fine. You know, my example for this for Europe is Italy. When the Monti government came to power in 2011, they passed more laws. Italy's problem is not more laws. Italy has more laws on the books than any other country in Europe. More laws is not the problem. Decree is not it, it's distribution that kind of matters. And then just, just one thing I would say at the end of this, can you print your way out of this where there's no inflation? I'm not advocating a kind of MMT situation. I don't think that you need to. If you've got a world that's basically integrated and globalized and financialized in the way it is with all these old people who have all this money who don't need to spend it very crudely, then essentially any OECD government can now issue a 10 to 15, 20 year bond at a negative real rate. So essentially investors are giving you money. They expect to get less back 10 years than what they do now. And no, bizarrely, no bond auction is failing. They just keep coming back for more. At that point in time, I'd like to take advantage of those financing conditions because you don't usually get to do that. And as for where the inflation is, I think there's a, it's, a, it's a very real one. What people care about are wages and house co housing costs, right? So if your wages are stagnant, your housing costs are going up, yeah, that's an inflation in the sense that your purchasing power buys less. But what's, you've got to be clear about what's causing that. And inflation is a general rise in the level of all prices, right? Asset price inflation is a bunch of rich people who have all the money have bid up the prices of a limited stock of goods and turned them into an asset class to benefit themselves. That's actually what's happened with housing. That's not an inflation. That's a political economy of distribution move. And that's something you can attack with different instruments. So I will, I will concede everything, but defend some things, if that makes sense. Uh, thank you. And Leo? Yeah, well, thank you very much for this uh, truly interesting talk. And for people who are not uh, social scientists or something, it, it gives a lot of uh, food for thought. 
uh, things to consider, especially, you know, you, 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 your talk falls in a very special week. So, you know, there is a kind of uh, coincidence that is good for us. Now, I, as part of uh, my, my way to try to later think more about your talk, I, I, I would ask uh, uh, the following question. Anger is a reaction of people who still believe they can make some change uh, or would like some change to come somehow. Now, when you talk, you, you, you gave a description, I think it was a kind of global description, but then you reset is an American one. Yeah, very that, much. That yeah. may apply also to some countries in Europe. I don't know if, if, even if it can apply to Israel, but there mm -hmm. are other countries in the world, like let's say Latin America, where, you know, I think people are not even angry anymore, or at least in some countries, right? So my question is then, do you, did you, uh, you, you agreed or, or immediately that, that you're, uh, the way you presented it, it was, but I guess that you don't like to see it only as something that may apply to the United States. So my question is, how do you see this also? Because not yeah. only in the various countries, but also speaking about global, global economy, how, does it, how can you change these this problems at the global yeah. level? And also in places where there is no anger anymore. The people no, are simply in all despair. Fair. Yeah, all, all fair. Look, we, we wrote it for the audience that we know. I live in the United States, he lives in London, we're both foreigners in our adopted countries. We think that this travels into parts of, definitely parts of Europe. I think it can, you know, explains lots of German politics, Italian politics, even Swedish politics. Israel's an interesting case. It's one of the first things I thought of. Remember about 15 years ago, there was that kind of middle class revulsion against housing prices and cost of living that hit the Israeli cities. I mean, in a sense, you guys were well ahead of the curve on this one. And it really blindsided the government at the time because they were like, what, everything's fine? And they're like, no, everything's not fine, right? I mean, it really was an original expression of angrenomics. A fascinating example of this is what's been going on in Chile. So Latin America, you say, you know, it's a great way to put it. They're, they're almost like too angry. There's so much to be angry about. And they're right. Their fundamental problem is that they are commodity exporters and their political systems are run by people who benefit from being commodity exporters and everyone else gets screwed. Simple as that. Now, even the best example of this was Chile because they had a giant reserve fund in case the price of copper went down, whatever, right? Uh, starting about 18 months ago, there was a whole series of riots in Chile, which cost over 50 people their lives. And they've just finished doing something that like governments really don't like to do. They've rewritten the whole damn constitution, right? And if you listen to a lot of what was driving that, it was again that confluence of anger and economics. What was the proximate cause of those riots was a, a small rise in subway fares, which made a big difference to people's incomes. And if you think about France, right? So the whole um, uh, Gilles Jean, the yellow shirt, right? It was a diesel tax, which didn't apply to people. The, the bit I loved about this, this is why it blew up so much in many ways. It didn't apply if you owned a luxury yacht. Your diesel wasn't taxed, but if you're using it in my 15 year old Renault, then you get taxed. I mean, come on, you're just asking for a backlash, right? So I think that, yeah, I, I, I don't want to say it's a universal. I don't believe in universals. Natural scientists can do universals. You have constants, right? We don't have constants in the social world. Let's be honest about this, right? So if you have a, a, an evolutionary non-linear highly dynamic and uh, highly entropic system, which is what social systems are, right? Don't go around doing universals, it's a bad idea. But when you have certain quasi constants in the model and you can see these being replicated in different areas, it should kind of smell the same. And I think in some places it does. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, more questions, the floor is uh, open. Are we? There is a question in the chat from Maury. Do you want me to go for that? Yeah, no, no, no. Okay, I, yeah. <laughs> Unless Maury, you want to ask the question yourself. No, go ahead. I think you, you answered part of it, but it'll be interesting to put it in context more. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. I, I have struggled mightily with this because I, I, do you remember the television series, The X-Files? Right, I'm the Fox Mulder of MMT. I want to believe, 
right? I really want to believe, but I just can't. And the reason I can't is because Mark, there's- Mark, could, could you say two, uh, two sentences about the theory? Because not all of everyone knows. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So mon modern monetary theory, basic, for those who don't know, basically says that um, you, governments do not tax and spend. They spend and then tax. And once you realize this, the problem is essentially a shortage of money. So it's a distributional problem. Taxes are kind of bullshit. The only reason you really have taxes is because it's a way of enforcing payments to the government. And the government does this by having a uniform script that we all need to basically buy into and earn to provision the government. So if you really think about it, the, the constraint on an economy is not a spending constraint. It's not even a taxing constraint. It's an inflation constraint. And if we live in a world in which there seems to be no inflation and we have huge deficits in everything that we care about, why don't we just spend the damn money? And 80% of me agrees with that, but 20% of it doesn't, and it's a very important 20%. Number one, this seems to really only apply to the United States because you need to have a hegemonic currency that everyone else uses, trades in, treats as reserves, et cetera. Because if you're a small country like Israel and you just start basically printing your, your currency, What's going to happen is it turns out that you don't make everything that you need. In fact, you don't make most things that you need. You need to import. And if everybody else in the world notices that you double your money supply, then effectively you've halved its value. So what happens is you will have a flat, your exchange rate will go down. Now in MMT, that's not a problem. The flexible exchange rate solves that. It doesn't because unless you can substitute for those imports, what you're going to do is increase the cost of all of your imports massively which means that you're going to get inflation, which means that it stops before it starts. So unless you're a giant economy which can self-provision, it's kind of logically incoherent. It says that there's an inflation constraint that you don't need to worry about, there's no inflation. If you're a small economy and your exchange rate crashes by 50%, ask Argentina, you will get inflation really damn fast and there's not much you can do about it. So unless, if you're a small open economy, I just don't think it applies. That's it. And I, I, yet, I'm willing to be convinced. This is the Fox Mulder. I want, to be, I want to believe, right? But I've yet to see an argument that shows me that that's not the case. So, you know, that's my bottom line on it. I don't really think that this is a thing that can be used. The, the second problem I'll say just very briefly is the politics of this. I mean, MMT starts with the presumption that we all know what needs to be done. And it's dead easy. You just do this. Well, I don't know. I think there's about 80 million people in the United States that if you tried to do that would give them another reason to go for their guns. It kind of presumes that we all have pretty much left of center preferences and we're, we're in favor of massive government programs. The real economy completely disappears in this. Everything simply becomes a question of adequate monetary and fiscal policy from the government. Uh, I just don't see that flying in, the, in most places. I just don't see most people I know signing up for that. So the Fox Mulder position. Okay, thanks. Oli? Um, I don't understand uh, economic theory, and but I try to understand your, your, uh, your presentation. <laughs> and sort of to, to try to understand, um, there was this, uh, as you described, it's sort of a Keynesian hardware and, and software in terms of how the how the economy was set up, and there, there was a, a bug in it, and and we've all seen the bug, and there was no reset, and so taking the, this as a, as sort of the background of what you uh, are arguing for, why is there no reset? And it seems to me that from everything that you said, uh, sort of very broadly, very <laughs> roughly. It seems to me that, that, that there was no reset because labor has become too cheap. And um, it's not, it, it has become too cheap because of various reasons and I don't understand all of them, but it seems that if you don't have labor unions uh, pushing for higher wages and you don't have the ability to uh, have competitive labor, then um, what sort of fixes could address that? Um, if, it, if, it, if it remains so that uh, labor is cheap for, for, for corporations and if they go to another country when there's a strike or if they can bring in more uh, um, mechanization or, other, you know, 
everything that goes on in, in recent uh, trends, what sort of reset could, could fix that if, if labor is remaining cheap and weak? Um, you, you know more economic theory than you can possibly imagine if you can already get to that conclusion, <laughs> right? Yes, um, that's the huge problem. And, and part of that is the other thing that you just signaled, which is capital can move abroad. So, you know, the so-called golden age, which, you know, let's be honest, was not golden for minorities, was not golden for women. It was golden for sort of like, you know, male wage earners. But at least it was a position whereby the wage share was not only stabilized, it was increasing over time. This was an era of prosperity, even within its constraints. What made that possible was that you couldn't take your capital and move it elsewhere. Right? So the combination of destroying labor on one side in terms of organization, and then opening up to global competition, both through imports, through real production, and then through finance, through the exiting of investment or the threats thereof, has been absolutely devastating. But it's also been incredibly wealth creating in terms of if you live in Tel Aviv, right? If you live in Los Angeles, if you live in New York or Boston or London or Copenhagen or Amsterdam, right? If you've hit, that, hit there at the right time and you have the set of skills or family connections or assets or education that is the social capital and financial capital you need in that environment, it's kind of awesome. Now, go back to the point that basically legislatures really just legislate for the top 20%. And then you've got a self-sustaining system, even if 80% of people aren't benefiting from it. So you have a kind of, if you will, a sufficiently strong minority who benefits from this that it becomes very hard to break. And you see this in the way that the Democrats have made no attempt to actually make any type of common cause with the American working class in the last election. They, what they did was they just won, right? They just won in a handful of states by fractions because the coalition was urban. It was educated. It was minority. It was public employee. It was tech worker, right? It was everyone who fits into that kind of, if you will, coastal elite I did well box. And that was suburban. That was just enough to drive it over the line while basically massively ignoring the entire American working class who simply weren't part of their imaginary. Now that to me is the long-term threat to political stability. That's part of why you see what you see in Washington last week. What you saw there was the angry white working class who do not see that their vision of anything is represented in anything at all that the Democrats do. Now, whether it is or is not is open to dispute, but they do not see it that way. And that's the fragility that gets built into this. One more thing I would say that happened is our politicians got worse. The quality of our politics declined over time. So an interesting little statistic on this. Um, if you go back to the 1960s, your angle, an average congressman uh, was in Congress for around 12 years, right? So that meant like three terms in the House, four to, six terms in the House, uh, three terms in the Senate, you know, long term. These are people who did this. This is what they did. And hence bipartisanship, et cetera, et cetera. This has been declining over time and across parliaments. Essentially, now you go in for one, you might get a junior ministerial gig. If you survive another parliament, you become a senior minister. What you then do is you take the expertise that you get by working on the health committee or the defense committee, and you go off and you work with a consultancy afterwards on how to get government contracts. Right? You're no longer a public servant. You're basically instrumentalizing public service to create private assets for you later in your life. And that is a great way to undermine trust in your system. And that's been going on right across the whole world. So I think that the quality of our governments have actually fallen at the same time. So there are these structural forces, but it doesn't help when your politicians are awful. Oh, thanks. Maya? Yeah, um, thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, I also don't know a lot about uh, economics or economic theory. And I'm um, sure you're about to say, prove yourself wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I want to go back to your distinction between uh, tribal anger and moral anger and its connection to culture world wars and, and this idea of essentialism. Um, I think it's interesting to think about 
I would like to hear more about this distinction because mm -hmm. I'm trying to think about how it connects to, for instance, uh, feminist protests or that idea. Because um, I'm not sure I can make that distinction uh, very clearly when I'm thinking about feminist activism right. or whatever. And, and particularly, I'm not sure how changing, for instance, the capitalist system, uh, um, solves uh, yeah. these issues, which we know are present uh, in different types of systems. And then to go back to your point about essentialism, for instance, um, the idea that if we're trying to say, you know, a different type of person experiences the world differently, it, it's not necessarily essentialism, right? Because we can, can think of it as kind of social constructivism and say, well, yes, it's all social, but it still means that right. I live in a different world as a woman than I would as a man and da 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 da, -da Carol right. Gilligan, whatever. So yeah, I'm wondering, I'm sure you've been asked this question. I'm wondering what you think about it. Yeah, I, I only have horrible answers by essentially <laughs> inadequate answers, right? I don't want to deny the autonomy of culture, but my counterfactual is constantly this one. Whenever we have periods of rising real wages, none of this crap goes on. You just don't see it. There's no minority parties taking 20% of the vote on sort of nasty right wing. It just, it just doesn't happen, right? It's in moments of like basically micro and macro stress that you get this. Now, does that mean that I want to make culture autonomous? Uh, I, I want to wipe out the autonomy. No, absolutely not. I mean, experience, et cetera, et cetera, is there. But, I'm going to give you an example as to how double-edged this is and why ultimately how that gets played in a way which suggests to me an unintended but very consequential essentialism. So let me ask you a question, right? Should um, anyone who wants to uh, be allowed to change their gender? You're asking me? Yes, I, yeah. I would say it. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay, fine. I mean, personally, I'm with you, right? Now, what that means is, if you then say that, is that there is nothing essential in one's gender such as the experience of women that you need to live that experience in order what it means to be a woman. Any, like any guy can become a woman. That's a very consequential statement. Now, go to the next one. Should you be able to change your race? It's a good question. Right. And, and all of us will say no, because there's something different about that. There's something wrong about that, right? Suddenly we're bringing a kind of backdoor moral rectitude into that. that no, you need to have the experience of African-Americans to be an African-American. That's ridiculous. But by the same token, you need the experience of being a woman to be a woman. It's not just a question of surgery, is it? And again, I don't say, I'm not saying I'm pushing this answer, but I think what it does is it shows us that we're picking very subconsciously particular essentialisms and kind of normalizing them. That African-Americans are this, that they have that experience. And I mean, somebody that I know personally is Michael Steele, the African-American ex-director of the Republican Party, who is livid about everything that's going on. But he's still a Republican and he's been a Republican his whole life. So, you know, when, when he hears the word African-Americans and that equals Democrat, equals this, equals that, equals that, he says, no. A third of the people in the African-American community have conservative preferences, like they do in almost every community. And I think that's why we get surprised by things like, hey, it turns out a third of all Mexicans voted for Trump, despite him calling them all rapists and murderers. Well, I guess there are a bunch of men who are Catholics, who are extremely hierarchical and deeply conservative, probably think Trump's okay. So it's that type of valence in culture that I, I think that if, we, if we're not careful, we create these unintended essentialisms. And we do it all subjectively all the time. Which okay. is more of an answer than you ever wanted. It was kind of like a discord. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting point. It's just that what I'm trying to get at, I think is, is kind of from a different place. I mean, it's all you're saying is true and it's an important question, but um, at the end of it, even at the economic level or at the social level, we know that different groups of people um, can experience objective um, difficulties, right? We know that in Israel, Mizrahi, uh, people with Mizrahi last names, uh, will it will be harder for them to get particular jobs. So. It, these are objective truths that these people encounter that would lead to anger. But, but even then, even then, so uh, 
I don't know if you caught this one, but at the same time as the presidential election this year in California, there was a ballot initiative to extend affirmative action to basically all government contracting, all open tenure contracts, whatever. Um, the Californians voted it down. White people voted for it. Every single minority group voted against it. So the objective facts that you just said, the people who those objective facts apply to, they rejected them. Yeah, but poor people can reject your idea of having a different kind of economic. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm not sure what this. Well, I'm not, not sure what this what means. It when what well, it means when you invoke the word fact, you're saying that there is something that, in a sense, is like Planck's constant, or you know glass right it's, it's a fixed thing we all see it we all know what it is and therefore we act around the world on that my point is we don't that's the essence of politics in a sense that we are when we take things as facts that those facts are rejected by the subjects themselves we can say well yeah poor people vote against their interests I, i've never known what to do with that because it's their interests you know we should take them as they are so if a third of all Mexicans vote for Trump, this is something that we need to accept and deal with rather than kind of increasingly just say it's an aberration. I think that's what I'm getting at. That's the wrong response. It's to and understand it on its own terms, right? And in a sense, and to take culture very seriously at that level. That's what I mean by the autonomy of culture there. But like I say, I don't really have answers. I just have a kind of thoughts around that as a process. I think that the, the, the one of the question is what is a fact, and the social and most social facts are statistical. Yes. So, absolutely. so that's of course a very different whether you personally felt that. And that's that's yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And the claim, if I understood correctly, of Mark was that the, stati the statistical average is not any one person, and we don't need to give it to all the all the group. Absolutely. And again, one of the ways that we do this, if we think about polling, right? So polling looks at averages. Implicitly, what polling does is assume that there's a kind of median voter, the person in the middle, the average, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at the United States today, what you have is a quadratic distribution of preferences, right? It's two peaks with a gap in the middle. So if you're constantly looking for the middle, you're going to completely misunderstand what's going on. So in a sense, you know, those, those statistical distributions matter as much as the preferences contained under the set. Thanks. Uh, Mickey. Yes, hi. Um, well, thank you for, for this uh, luminous talk. And um, I, I'm under the impression that following the 2008 financial crisis and more so during the current COVID-19 pandemic, there is a growing number of economists um, perhaps mostly uh, uh, macroeconomists who are willing to rethink and, and, and uh, challenge the disi disciplinary taboos and paradigms. So I, I actually wanted to, to ask you what kind of reactions and comments you, you received from economists who, who read the book or you, you had conversations with. Uh, so in other words, I, I, I would like to ask whether my initial impression is right. Is there a re, some kind of re-challenging of taboos and paradigms? I, I think that there, there definitely is. The response has been generally very positive and almost kind of like, yeah, we know that. Why is this news? But I think within that sentence, there's a lot going on. So I'll give you an example of this. The OECD, the people who brought us the 1983 jobs report, the people who pushed capital account openness, right? I mean, vanguard of neoliberalism have been running a seminar for the past couple of years called, um, what's it called again? It's, it's called something along the lines of like critical and existential challenges, right? Uh, NIAC, new approaches to economic challenges. But, but beneath that essentially is this, the whole system is screwed. If we don't do some fundamental rethink here, the entire capitalist system goes down. This is an official part of the OECD, right? So, you know, that's quite remarkable that I think is going on. But then, for any of you who are sociologists, you will understand this better than anyone. There's the professional politics that go along with this. And the professional politics or the politics of profession moves very incrementally. There's gatekeepers in journals. There's moving things by increments. There's not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. There's the fact that the most senior people who 10 years ago were talking the right stuff still have the senior position today in the university. They're the people most likely to be asked by the Fed to do a study. 
et cetera, et cetera. There's a revolving door amongst these institutions, which is generationally weighted. So I think what happens is that Thomas Kuhn had this right all those years ago, that revolutions in science, that the paradigm can be completely hollowed out, but it needs some outsiders and young people to come in and point it out to everyone. And what I see increasingly across the social sciences, not just in economics, is that this younger generation, which is much, much more empirically driven and has much better empirical tools, is increasingly saying, this doesn't smell right. And we saw that first, or, or we saw this, for example, in microeconomics a decade ago, when the whole case for minimum wages called causing unemployment just fell apart. It just, it's not true. And what we're seeing is kind of one shibboleth after another being pushed. And, but that's, that's an, when it comes to the intellectual politics of that can be quite fast, but the practical professional politics of how that transforms institutions, that's very slow. And I think that we're getting there in the sense that we've had a generation and a bit of, if you will, high neoliberalism, and we're definitely past that. The OECD program and other programs show this, the new Institute for New Economic Thinking, there's all these things, but we haven't had quite the replacement of cadres, right? As, as Chairman Mao put it, if you want to have a revolution, you've got to replace the cadres. No, I've never quoted Chairman Mao in my life, so this is what you brought me to. So. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Eud? Thank you for this enlightening talk and a very thought-provoking book. And I just want to hear you speak a little bit more, so I'll be very brief. So I wonder uh, if you can uh, position your... your uh, analysis and views in to Thomas Piketty's diagnosis and to the solution suggested by Yannis Varoufakis because of similarities and differences is whether all this assumes a sort of stable, static, uh, geopolitical order, specifically with the U.S. at its, at its center, or will this break down once people start moving and the U.S. starts declining? both things that are already yeah. undergoing. Uh, again, great questions. You broke up there, but I got all the vital parts. Uh, on Varoufakis, it depends which version of Varoufakis. Ultimately, that's a kind of uh, over-accumulation argument, which you get with Robert Brenner and other people. And in a sense, an over-accumulation argument, I, I have difficulties with it because the solution to it is simply just raise consumption and raise investment. So if you basically have too much production, the problem is you've got a glut, fine, clear the glut. There are ways of clearing gluts and it doesn't have to be war. You know, we're smarter than that. So that, that one I don't think is a critical test. Uh, is Piketty right? If he's right about one thing, it's this notion of neo-patrimonialism, cemented inequality continuing over time. And that's highly fragilizing to use that term. And I don't think that that lasts. So perhaps the combined forces of an overaccumulation crisis, if you want to use that language, uh, plus a legitimacy crisis coming from sustained inequality is enough to hollow out the democratic settlement we have now. If that is the case, then the place that that is most likely to happen, and you're right, we're already seeing it, is in the United States. Now, this matters for one reason, the dollar. Right? It really matters because everybody else banks in dollars and there just isn't anything to move into. So one of the reasons that Bitcoin is on the tier that it is, is because it gives you an alternative asset you can hold that isn't linked directly to gold and isn't and is completely delinked from dollars. So um, one of the ways that they're trying to control this is the whole uh, investigation suddenly by central banks into central bank digital currencies. In a sense, what they want to do is create the financial channels of the digital currency that would push out private sector alternatives because governments do not want to lose their monopoly of money provision. Right? Again, I'll, I'll sound MMT without being one in many ways. Um, so I think that that is where you get the, the stress channel there. Now, is this all preordained? Are we all going to fall? I don't know. I've got a, a friend of mine who's third generation American military, and he has a nice line on this. He says, I know the whining of the American right when I hear it. It's incredibly vociferous until they're embarrassed, and then they go home and sit on top of piles of money and solve their conscience. And, you know, it's a cheap line, but there may be something to it in the sense that the people who are most effective in undermining this order 
are some of the richest people in American society. And at some point, point you, at some point you would hope that they would realize that they're putting their own assets and their own prosperity at risk. But perhaps I'm just being naive. Maybe chaos is ultimately the goal. But that's how I, that's how I would think about positioning what I'm saying in relation to those. Yeah, perhaps just in, in connection to that, there was um, a question by uh, Victor asking me, he has a, for technical reasons, to ask. And if you, he said that maybe this question belongs to the social sciences, and but he wonders how comes that the outcome, how come that the angry keep voting for representatives of the rich, uh, in spite of the rich causing the misery of the blue collar, or, and this, of course, the the example of the US yeah. is the most... Uh... It's, that's the $64,000 question, as they say. Um, one answer which I like is the following. There's a paper that's been done recently at the LSE uh, by some political scientists, and it's called Golfing with Trump. Now, this is a, a takeoff from a paper that came out 20 years ago, a famous paper called Bowling with Hitler. And of course, one of the things that the Nazis did in the period of upheaval after the collapse of the Weimar state was any Weimar sort of public institutions and funding for public activities completely collapsed. And the Nazis already brought people in with a very diverse, robust set of social institutions, picnics and all this sort of stuff, blah, blah, blah. And that kind of social infrastructure, right, playing off of Robert Putnam, bowling alone, bowling with Hitler, right, basically social capital matters. The LSE piece is called Golfing with Trump. And basically what it says is the following. One of the main predictors of whether you get a right-wing populist reaction, there's two of them in particular. One is old people. Just have a bunch of old people. You're, you're primed for it, right? The second one is not your absolute level of income. It's not whether you're rich or poor. It's whether your income has been in relative decline for a long period of time. So you can be in the 100th percentile and go to the 90th, or you can be in the 30th and go to the 20th. The effect is the same in terms of the shift. So decline plus old means you're pretty much primed for this. Now, if you live in a medium-sized city, small, smaller city, medium-sized town that has good social institutions, think golf clubs, et cetera, then everyone has a way of communicating a common picture as to what this relative decline is and what's causing it. And what you don't have is diversity. What you don't have is immigrants. What you don't have is a dynamic economy. So the types of narratives that get generated are very much the exclusionary nationalist, things were better back then, we need to restore what has been lost, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Where do people get their information? And if you think about you know, the Facebook issues, et cetera, et cetera, the social media issues, these are just extensions of our basic social networks. Right, we, we like what we like. And all that digital media does in a sense is dopamine supercharge the type of information flows we are already directed to. And there are certain areas in a sense which are primed for those type of reactions, which is essentially the argument of paper. I think that's very, very insightful, right? When I go to, um, you know, when I, I go back to Scotland, for example, Scotland's typically seen as a, a left-wing country and in many ways it is. But you talk to the working classes about immigration and you get exactly the same responses you get when you talk to Trumpists. And I get exactly the same thing when I go to Germany and talk to people in Germany. So there's something about those communities, their information flows, their social networks, and how it constructs a particular understanding that makes sense on a local level, irrespective of its capital T truth content. Yeah. Thank you very much. We are just over the time and we have a few more questions. We'll have the last question uh, for this evening. Uh, Tammy, please. Okay, thank you for letting me ask the last question. I'll be very brief. Uh, there's one thing that I, I keep thinking in my mind that you haven't mentioned. And I think it's, it might, I think it's important, especially after I've lived in the Midwest for two years, uh, which is religion. So mm -hmm. you said, you talked about white working class going to be that as the, that you, you described the Trump nationalist as white working class, which I agree with that. But there's another element, which is religion that yeah. is very strong and unite them. And it's not 
any religion. It's it, they, they have specific characteristic of this religion, which is also um, racist mm-hmm. and misogynistic. If if connecting it to what Maya was asking about um, uh, the the power relations between uh, different groups in society, yeah. and so and that that is a very very strong notion for a lot of Trump supporters, even though he's not religious at all, has no yeah. idea about it, but it kind of connects people very strongly. So I, I th- for the US, I think you're absolutely right. And we just didn't talk about it at all in the book. And I think that it's absolutely true. I mean, one of the areas that you see this is a very interesting example is Costa Rica. So Costa Rica is next door to Nicaragua. Nicaragua is a 300 year civil war, right? And in 1930, the first, and this is the following, I swear to God it's true. In 1930, the Nicaraguan government commissioned its first ever official history. So the official history of Nicaragua was entitled, are you ready? Country of Irredeemables, right? So basically they called themselves, you know, what Hillary called the Trumps, right? You know, the, 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 the deplorables, the irredeemables, right? Next door, you have this country called Costa Rica that has a civil war in 1948 that kills about 20 people. They're so freaked out by this, they then basically invent consociationalism and make it last for 60 years. Its per capita GDP is three times its neighbor. It's perfectly stable. It's fantastic. Everything's going great. It started to exhibit exactly the same political trends as Nicaragua and about six years ago. Why? Evangelical Protestantism. Because if you bring that into your politics, and this is also the Bolsonaro coalition, this is much of Latin America, once you strip out passive Catholicism and it becomes abortion, individualism, God over everything else, moral certitude, hierarchy, domination of women, right? All of that, that becomes a real political force in its own right. I totally agree. But there's an interesting twist. If you look at countries like Germany or Sweden, where no one goes to church, right? you still have those right-wing reactions, but they're much weaker. And I think that's the amplifying role that that, that, that you're absolutely correct that religion plays. It takes those existing social networks I was just talking about and really amplifies the misogyny, the hierarchy, the violence, all the moral certainty that because I'm on this side, I am empowered to do violence. That's That's the difference that God makes. I think that's why you get the much more um, violent right-wing version in societies that are open and much more actively religious as opposed to secular societies. Where you get, coincidentally, if you think about Spain, Spain has an institutionalized left-wing populism. Podemos is now part of the furniture, right? And in Europe, you can see the Greens as the most successful party in Germany just now. So you can see populism, dissatisfaction with the center, taking an entirely different move in part because they don't believe in God. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop here and uh, as the, the end of, uh, uh, of this very interesting uh, evening. And of course, there are so many questions. I apologize for the people who wanted to ask questions when they had no time for uh, in this evening. And because it's clear that it's opened many other questions and many other uh, aspects that could not be uh, talked of in, in 35 or even 90 minutes. So thanks again, Mark, for this very interesting talk and Farn Gal for, the, for your reaction and for your very thoughtful ideas about uh, Mark's work. Thank you all for coming. I know you could, there's always other things to do. Whenever I see one of these meetings, I think to myself, is Netflix broken? You know, you could be doing something else. <laughs> So that's great. So thank you for, for taking the time. I learned a great deal from my conversation. Sincerely, I am glad that we did this. Uh, thanks to Gal for the excellent comments that, that opened this up and for the excellent questions that followed. And I hope that when travel resumes, I will once again get to come and see my friends in Israel. Yeah. Please. Absolutely. All the best. Thank you.